all for being here this morning. Happy New Year. I feel like I haven't taught all year. And it's a real... Do- <laughs> it gets worse. I am the dad who had four daughters home for Christmas. And the four daughters declared in concert that we were going to watch a Christmas movie each night. And everybody got to pick one. So we watched something happened or it happened on Fifth Avenue... Uh, we watched uh, Miracle on 34th Street. Uh, um, it was my turn to pick the Christmas movie. I picked The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. <laughs> we were about 35 minutes into it, and they're on like the third or fourth hanging when one of my daughters says, Dad, how is this a Christmas movie? And I said, Have you not seen all the things hanging from the trees? That's. <laughs> I have missed this class. So we're going to take a brief hiatus from John because uh, of an experience that I had. I was here at church a couple of Sundays ago. Pastor Stephen Trammell was preaching, did a magnificent job challenging us as we go into the new year from a passage in, in, in Joshua 24 verse 23. And I'm sitting out uh, uh, in the seats with my family, but I I try to follow along. If it's in the New Testament, then I'll follow along in the Greek. If it's from the Old Testament, I'll follow along in the Hebrew. It's just sort of a way I try to keep up the languages. And and so I was following along in the Hebrew, and I thought, wow, um, uh, he's done a fantastic job at challenging us here. But if you drill down, dig down into this Hebrew, you've got a few more nuggets that we could even spend a little more time into the verse with. And and so I was thinking through that, and then I was talking to to Pastor David over the holidays, and and I said, you know, I'm thinking about taking the life group class and just doing a little hiatus for a little bit from John and digging into a couple of passages. And I talked to him through He said, uh, if I were you, I'd do that. I think the class will enjoy it. And John has been there for 2,000 years. It'll be there when you get back. And I said, okay, I'm going to do it. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to take a brief hiatus and look at what I'm calling passages worth the dig. I showed Becky that opening slide and said, do you think that slide works? And she said, well, it looks like this woman's about to destroy the Bible. And I said, okay. She said, maybe it works for tomorrow, but you may want a different slide after that. So this is a temporary one. And uh, we may do another opening slide later. I'm always open to suggestions. Here's the introduction to class. There is a fella, or actually was a fella. He's been dead for 500 years almost. Francois Rabelais, as we would say in Lubbock. I have no clue how they said that in France. But it was probably, are the crosses here? Would one of the crosses say that out loud, real loud, please? Yes. (laughs) Francis the robber, as we would say in Lubbock. Francois Ravelet, as Charles just said. This fella was a really bright guy. He was a very good Greek scholar. He was a very good scholar in lots of areas, philosophy and others, back in the 1500s. And he wrote a book. And the book is called Various Things, but Gargantua and Pantagruel is one of the common titles If you want to get a translation of the book, you can buy them off Amazon or read them online. I will tell you that the book is extremely crude. It's got some very crude things in it. What the book is, is an expose of some of the vices of humanity put into a monstrous scale. So Gargantua and and, uh, Gargantua's child, Pantagruel, are giants. And they have giant vices. So if you're reading in chapter 5 on drinking, they don't merely have a glass of wine with supper. They drink like a sponge. And drinking and drunkenness is the pursuit of the monsters within that chapter. And within that chapter... At one point toward the end of chapter 5, I think it is, toward the end, 
uh, uh, the, the giant's mug has been emptied. He has had all of the, 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 the drink in it, and he wants more. And he proclaims the following sentence in Latin. Natura abhorret vacuum. Meaning what? Nature abhors a vacuum. That's exactly right. Now, son, you better put that hoover away before Mother Nature gets really mad. Nature abhors a vacuum. That's a, 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 a phrase that's made it into English today, and we think about it in terms of physics, because if you have a vacuum, air, things are going to come into it. Nature abhors a vacuum. But it's not only in physics. So there is a psychologist in California named Leon Seltzer. And uh, he's written a book or two, but he's also uh, published uh, articles in Psychology Today. And in 2009, he published an article entitled, Human Nature Abhors a Vacuum Too. Because part of human nature is this desire to fill the emptiness and the voids and the meaninglessness in life. And he wrote about people who do that with certain vices and behaviors that, that aren't good and appropriate behaviors. Now, Leon Seltzer was not the first person to take this concept and apply it beyond the world of physics into the world of human nature. Blaise Pascal was an amazing thinker in the 1600s. He didn't live long. He died before his 40th birthday. But Blaise Pascal had written a lot on philosophy and on science and on theology. And after his death, a collection of his writings on philosophy and theology were put together and published. It's commonly just called the Pincies. Pincies means thoughts. So these are the thoughts of Monsieur Pascal about religion and other subjects. And so uh, uh, you've got his collection of thoughts. In that, he wrote the following. When addressing a craving, a, a, a desire to know more, a desire to find meaning, he said, what does this craving and this helplessness proclaim but... That there was once in man a true happiness of which all that remains is the empty print and trace. And he goes on to say, then man tries in vain to fill this emptiness with everything around him. Seeking in things that are not there the help he cannot find in the things that are there. And though none of them can help, since this infinite abyss can only be filled with an infinite and immutable object. In other words, by God himself. And so Blaise Pascal took the, the idea of nature, human nature, abhors a vacuum, and took it even further and said, it's evidence not only of what we were, but it's evidence of, of a, it's a craving that will only find satisfaction in God. Now, Blaise Pascal was not the first one to come up with that. Human nature has been human nature since human nature. And so you can go back a thousand plus years to St. Augustine. Augustine of Hippo wrote a, an account of his coming to faith called The Confessions. It is a book that you can readily get. It is a book, if you have not read it, I would suggest you put it on your list. It is a great book to read. There are other books by Augustine I don't put on my list or yours. That's not because they're not great. But they're not that great. <laughs> they're good. 
but not great. This is an amazing book that can change your life. This one ranks up in the top 100 books on your shelf. So the Confessions of St. Augustine. Now he begins the very entire book of his history of converting to God and faith. He begins with this statement. Great are you, Lord, and greatly to be praised. Great is your power, and infinite in is your wisdom. And man desires to praise you because he's part of your creation. All of creation praises God. Humans have a choice in the matter. But the rest of creation, simply by being creation, glorifies the one who made. Man has a choice, but man is part of creation and desires to praise you. He bears his mortality about him and carries the evidence of his sin and the proof that you do resist the proud, still he desires to praise you. This man who's only a small part of your creation. You have prompted him that he should delight to praise you because you made us for yourself. And restless is our heart until it comes to rest in you. Until you find a relationship with the Creator, you are haunted by this emptiness, a meaninglessness, a search for something that matters. And so we've got these two situations. We've got a situation that says, if you don't know God, you've got an emptiness because you were made to know God. But even knowing God, you were made to be holy and to be like God. So you still have a craving and a restless desire to be more than you are. What do we do with that? Well, we typically try to fill it up, according to these wise people. We try to fill it up with different things. We try to find something that either brings us meaning, brings us purpose, or numbs us to that desire for meaning and purpose. That's where we are. Pastor Stephen, what an honor. This is the man who started me on this passage. I didn't know you were in here. Stand up. Ah, he is the reason we're teaching this today because he inspired me to do this work. Great are you, Lord. So we've got this situation. We need God to fulfill that search for relationship with him but even in relationship with him we're desperately needing to clean up our house now within that framework look at this teaching from Jesus it's in Matthew and Luke I've put the Luke version up here Jesus said when the unclean spirit has gone out of a person it passes through waterless places seeking rest and finding none it says I will return to my house from which I came and when it comes it finds the house swept out put in order looking good so it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself and they enter and dwell there and that last state of the person is worse than the first now you may be looking at this and saying I'm not demon possessed this isn't simply talking about demon possession. And if you're kicking back your shoes and saying, that's not my problem, I'm doing fine, I want to urge you, it is the problem we all have. 
You see, there are three buckets we can live in. There's a bucket of people who find meaning in destructive behaviors. Maybe those behaviors are, are again, as I said before, maybe they're trying to fill a longing and desiring for care and meaning in life. Or maybe they're trying to numb that drive for meaning. But there are people who find meaning in destructive behaviors. There are people who fight to clean up those destructive behaviors. We see that especially right now with New Year's resolutions. But there is a third bucket of people. And this third bucket are people who meaningfully find purpose in life. In truly productive ways they live with meaning. Now, within the framework of this background, I want us to take the challenge that Pastor Stephen launched me on with his spectacular sermon on Joshua 24, 23, a passage, I got to be honest, I had never paid attention to until you preached on it. Never paid attention to it. And he preached on it. I thought, man, this is great. And your sermon purpose, I had no idea it was going to be in here. Your ser- Be wise, review, and revise. It's close, isn't it? It was fantastic. And so I took that text and I thought, I really, this text I've not seen. I don't know where it, it's gone from me. But I'm going to dig this text out. I'm going to translate this text. I'm going to work on this text. I'm going to take his sermon to heart. And here we are today. Joshua said, put away the foreign gods that are among you and incline your heart to the Lord, the God of Israel. Here are the three things I want to do with that passage with you today. First of all, let's make sure we're fresh on the passage within its context. And then after we make sure we're fresh on that passage within its context, we're going to dig in a little bit deeper with some stuff that will put 70 to 80% of you asleep. You should never start out a message with that. You should never tell people you're going to go to sleep, but 70 to 80% of you are going to go to sleep. And that's okay. You've got my permission to go to sleep because we will wake you up for the third part, and that's where we're looking for the fruit, okay? It's okay. 20% of you will not go to sleep. You nerds out there are going to really enjoy that that part where everybody else is going to sleep. Okay? Here's the passage. Let's put it into context. Joshua said, put away the foreign gods that are among you and climb your heart to the Lord, the God of Israel. Now, Israel was a nation, but it was a nation made up of people. There. There. This is not working really well. It works so much better in my brain. Israel, see, those are a bunch of little people. You can kind of see that. Yeah, kind of zoom in on them. I'm not saying they're good people, bad people. They're stick people. But they're people. And the reason I say that is because you can tell the nation, you can tell the church, you can tell uh, groups, This group be this way, this group be this way. But we're all individuals, and so it's not just a corporate challenge, it's a personal challenge. It's not just a corporate challenge, it's a personal challenge. Because all of the Israelites, like all of us today, could be in three different buckets. Don't think we uniquely have human nature in the year 2020. They had human nature in 1232 B.C. In fact, these are a bunch of people who had been called out of Egypt by God, miraculously delivered from the world's most powerful army at the Red Sea, brought to Sinai where God was going to enter into covenant with them, And a bunch of them, trying to figure out life, decided the really good thing to do was going to be to build a golden calf. That did not turn out too well for them. 
from there they proceed on and they reach a point where they are thirsty, they don't have fresh water, and they start grumbling and they get angry with God. And they badmouth God. Their destructive behavior to try to meet their needs did not turn out too well for them. They reach the promised land and they send out 12 spies and the 12 spies come back and they say, man, you don't get it. They're like monsters there. The blessings are monstrously good, but the people are monstrously bad. There are giants in that land. And that need and desire for life and a holy life and a good life caused 10 of those 12 people to rally the rest of the individuals around. And instead of having a meaningful, productive, can't wait to see what God's going to do here, they engage in the destructive behavior of fear. That did not turn out too well for them. Generation dies away. Generation goes in. Starts conquering the promised land. First battle, Jericho. Wall comes tumbling down. City, taken. Next battle, Ai. God says in this next battle, you don't take anything. Devote everything to destruction because it shows your mind. And their mind. This is my land. I'm going to let you, Israel, occupy it. So Israel goes in. They destroy the people. A lot of the people just run away. But within the framework of that, some bright fella says, wait, God told Joshua to tell us to destroy all these livestock. I mean, this is a pretty good milk cow. I don't think God wants this to go to waste. And through their stubbornness, they try to find the answers to how they're going to live. That did not work out too well for them. Now, we do the same thing. I mean, we might want to categorize sin. Look, here, we can do it together. Can we go to the Elmo? Here, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna categorize sin. There are the really, really, really bad ones. These are the red ink sins. This is like really bad. Okay? Murder. That's like, that's a bad one. Let's see, what else? Really bad one. Huh? Fire? Oh, pride? Oh, that's not so bad. Really, really bad. It's like adultery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Really. Or how about stealing? Yeah, yeah. And then there are kind of bad. We'll call them level two bad. Level two bad is stuff like, uh, huh? Huh? Lying. Yeah. Pride. That's probably a level two. I'm proud to say I don't have that problem. <laughs> Lying. Pride. Um, oh, how, huh? Envy. Oh, yeah. Envy and jealousy. That's a level two. I mean, it's, after all, that's understandable. I'd like that. Envy. Jealousy. And then there are level three, and level three are almost green light. I mean, these are like almost, hey, no trouble. Level three is stuff like um, cheating. Cheating's level two. Uh, cheating at cards? No, playing cards. No. <laughs> um, level three is, is, yeah, gluttony. Gluttony. I mean, come on. I can't even spell it. That's how much I don't have it. Um, gluttony. Um, this is stuff like um, 
Gossip. Oh, yes. Gossip is, gossip is just praying for people. <laughs> I don't want to gossip, so let me tell you about this so you can pray about it. <laughs> now, we can categorize the sins, but that doesn't work. I'll give you some sins that you didn't put on level three. Worry, fear instead of faith, disobedience, trying to get it yourself, your way instead of God's way, selfishness. Okay, so what do we do? Let's go back to the PowerPoint. So we've got these destructive behaviors, these sins. A different PowerPoint. Let's go to my PowerPoint. <laughs> Although we are welcoming you and glad you've joined us. So maybe it's New Year's and we come up with New Year's resolutions. Maybe it's not because we want to clean up these destructive behaviors. Maybe it's not New Year's. Maybe it's just, I got to do something about this. I need to go to AA or I need to go to a, a, a therapist or a counselor or I, I, need, I need help or, or I need a, a prayer partner. I need a support group. I need, you know, I need a, some, a, a buddy system or I just need discipline, hardcore discipline. I'm not going to do it anymore. Okay? No. Let's go back to the passage. Joshua said, put away the foreign gods that are among you and incline your heart to the Lord, the God of Israel. That's the passage in context. And now I want us to dig deeper. This is where you've got my permission for the next eight to ten minutes to go to sleep. If you manage to stay awake and pick up any of this, I think it will help. But if not, I'll summarize it at the end. Just don't get scared. Some of you are going to say, huh? Ah. Because I want to talk about language, specifically grammar, specifically English verbs. Our grammar in English is a verb-intensive grammar. Verbs are words of action. And we tend to think of our verbs in their tenses. There are typically 12 tenses. We have the past tense. There are four different past tenses of verbs. You can just have the simple past tense and say, I eat. Eight. Thank you. <laughs> For me, the past is always present. <laughs> I ate. Simple past tense. You can have the continuous past tense, I was eating. You can have the perfect past tense, I had eaten. You can have the perfect continuous past tense, I had been eating. You get the flow. A lot of people, we just do this naturally. We may not even know what they're called. You got the same thing with the present tense. Let's see if I can get this one right. I eat, <laughs> simply. Or if it's continuous, I am eating. Or if it's perfect, present, I have eaten. It's what I, right now, I have eaten. Or we've got the perfect continuous. I have been eating. You can do the same with the future. I will eat. I will be eating. I will have eaten. I will have eaten. Okay, those are our verb tenses. Hebrew, throw that out the window. Hebrew verbs, just throw it out the window. What really, Mark, in fact, Hebrew verbs don't really have tenses in the way ours do. They sort of have two tenses. But you really tell the tense just by the context. What Hebrew verbs do, though, is something that's really bizarro world to most of us who are English speakers. They take the verb and they'll change the form of the verb to indicate what type of action is happening. So the verb is an action verb eat. But what type of eating changes with the way they form their verb? So they can take what's called the cow, the simple form of a verb, and it just means, you know, I eat, or I ate, or I will eat, depending upon time with context. But that's the simple verb form. 
I eat. Or they can make it in the PL form. Same letters. You, you add a, a P to it, but, but the, the same letters that, of the root of the verb. They just change it and put it into the PL form. And once they put it into the PL form, it is intense. So it's not just eating. It's like really eating. It's like chowing down. It's like two forks at once. Okay? It's really devouring. And so when the translators come upon it, it's the same word as eat. But they've got to translate the intensity of it. Remember, in English, most of us function with 50 to 60,000 words. In biblical Hebrew, if you take out the names, you've got about 6,000 words. You've got one word in Hebrew has to do duty of like 10 words in English often. So... It's the same word as eat. It's just you translate it intensely. I devour. I chow down. You can then put it into another form called the hifil. And that means I cause something to happen. Or, or you cause something to happen if it's you as the subject. But it's a causing of the verb. So it's instead of the same, exact same word. Instead of I eat, it might be I feed. Because I make others eat. I make something or someone eat. I cause them to eat. You follow me? Sort of? Those 20% awake? Okay, I won't take time, but there's the hit pile, which is reflexive, which means I feed myself. There's the nifal, which is passive, which means I get fed. There's the puol, which is reflexive and intensive. I get stuffed. There's the whole fall, which I ran out of room for on the screen, which is both passive and causing, all of this kind of stuff. Here's all that we care about right now. The same word can be used to say something simply or to say something causing. Whether it's in the cow, the simple form, or whether it's in the hifil form, causing. You got it? You can almost wake back up. Joshua said, put away the foreign gods that are among you and incline your heart to the Lord, the God of Israel. Put away is the Hebrew word sir. Sir, actually it's more of an ur sound. Sir. Sir. Means put away. But here's what it really is. You take that word sir, and at its root, it's conveying the idea of turning something aside. So Moses is going on his way as a shepherd before the big calling, and there's a burning bush. And the bush is burning, but it's not being consumed. And we read this passage in Exodus 3. Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight. So he's walking. Oh, look at that. I will turn aside, sir. It's just simple. I will turn aside to see this great sight and why the bush is not burning. When the Lord saw that he turned aside, sir, to see God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. Okay, you can just say simply, turned aside. That's the root idea behind sir. But if that's the call, there is a hifil, which means cause something to turn aside. Cause it to turn aside. Here's your passage for that. Um, remember, simple is just something is turned aside. Caused, the hifil form, means causing it, making it happen. And there's, there's, there's emphasis on the, the, the agent that makes that verb happen. Okay? So here's a passage that shows you both. This is good. This is when the curses are happening in Egypt. Moses is there. Pharaoh says to Moses, calls Moses and Aaron and says, Plead with Yahweh to take away 
the frogs. Now that to take away the frogs is hifil. God, make them leave. Make them turn aside. It's emphasizing the actor, the agent. God, would you make that activity happen? Moses, tell God to please make this frogs turn aside. Go away. Emphasis on the cause. Now, if you keep reading, in verse 11, the frogs shall go away from you. That's in the cow, the simple. They will turn aside. They will go away. God will cause it, and it will happen. Recognize the agent. Recognize the result. So just a good contrast. Exact same verb, exact same word. It's just in a different form. So now with this in line, look at the passage. Joshua said, put away the foreign gods. That word put away, that verb, turn aside, is in the hifil. Joshua is telling them, this is your choice. You do this. You cause it to happen. You be the agent of change. You cause it to happen. You cause those foreign gods to be turned aside. And then, look what he says, and incline your heart to Yahweh. Now that verb incline is the Hebrew verb nata. Nata. And what it at its root is talking about is this idea of stretching out. Um, I can stretch out my coat around my wife's shoulders when she's cold. Nata. In Genesis, uh, you'll read frequently for Abraham and his kids that they would stretch out their tent. Pitch their tent. Stretch it out. Nata. It just means to stretch out. So Joshua's saying, put away the foreign gods. Cause them to go away. And then nata, and here nata is again in the hithil form. Make this stretch out. You've got to make a conscious decision to incline your heart to the Lord. You've got to stretch out. So picture the Israelite in his individual capacity or her individual capacity. Picture the nation as a whole. Picture the family units. Picture the small groups on all of the different levels of life. Make a decision to cause the foreign gods to leave. Make a decision to cause your heart to be towards God, to stretch out. Stretch out yourself to God, your heart to God. Now the Hebrew word for heart, remember, it is this organ. Ba-boom, 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 okay? It's that organ, but to the Jewish mind in the biblical times, it's also where you thought. It wasn't your feelings. We have a tendency to think of it as Valentine's and emotion. It wasn't the seat of your emotions. That in Hebrew were your stomach, your bowels. The heart stood for where you thought. They didn't understand that was the brain. They thought it was the heart. So when you can translate the word mind here, Incline your mind. You be thinking about these things of God, not the things of the foreign gods. So that's the deeper dig. Now, where is the fruit in this for our lives? All right. Human nature abhors a vacuum. True. True. Here's the deal. We've got vacuums on multiple levels. That first level is... What, what, what is any purpose and meaning in life? There's a song by Paul Simon, Further to Fly. The open palm of desire wants everything. Wants everything. Wants everything. He says it over and over and over. There's something in life. And you got to find it. Simon and Garfunkel, Paul Simon again, wrote a song back in the 60s called America. And if you remember this song, he says, uh, 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 he, he and Kathy are basically going off to find meaning and purpose in life. 
And, and while Kathy's asleep, so they're venturing across America. That's the journey idea. I'm going to journey to find meaning in life. And while Kathy's sleeping, he says, Kathy, I'm lost, I said, though I knew she was sleeping. I'm empty and aching, and I don't know why. There is that human condition that needs God. There is a human condition that says, I need to be in a relationship with the one who made me. And nothing will fill that God-shaped hole any more than the kid's toy, which I still love to watch children do. And it's so hard for me not to tell them when they're trying to wedge the square into the triangle and trying to get the angle in there right. And I just want to say, no, 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 no. That goes over there. This goes over here. But you sit there and watch them in frustration while they learn spatial development. So that, that's, that's important. But the, 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 the analogy is we've got to choose God. That's, that's number one. If you're just running from any emptiness and meaninglessness in life, the answer is God. But I want to tell you, God doesn't call you simply to be saved, to be in a relationship with Him. He calls you to make you holy. There are two different words here, two different theological words. If we were in seminary, you would learn these words. One is called just if, i got to look over here to make sure I'm on the screen. Justification. It comes from, uh, in the Greek, uh, uh, it's the DK words. Uh, DK words, but it's dikaios, um, uh, all of these words that are formed off of DK. And what it means is right or righteous. And it's, it's, it's in theological terms, it's saved. It's, it's a fancy way of saying saved and, and declared righteous with God. And we all have a drive and a need for that. And that, it can be a triangle hole, whatever you want to call it. But it's a unique shaped hole and nothing else is going to fill it except God and being justified. None of us were made to exist alienated from God. But that's not the only drive for meaning in our life. There's another big word, sanctification. Sanctus is the Latin word it comes from. It means holy, hagios in the Greek. And this is the process of being made holy. Justification happens in salvation by the cross of Jesus Christ. By grace you have been saved through faith. Sanctification is a lifelong process as we are being transformed into the image of the Son of God. Genesis says we were made in the image of God. That doesn't simply mean hardwired with God's morality and, and God's love and God's meaning. But it also means image in that we are to reflect God to the world. So in Genesis 1, God names all of the, the things. In Genesis 2, he makes man in his image and man gets to name the things. Because we reflect God. And so we're made as an image, a mirror of God. So what God's got to do is not just save us, but then he's got to clean us up. And how he does that involves more than getting rid of the bad habits. So if we go back to the PowerPoint, we not only want to choose God, but we also want to choose godliness. And that brings us back to our buckets. We can be people who find meaning in destructive behaviors. Doesn't work out well. We can be people who fight to clean up those behaviors. New Year's resolutions. That in itself doesn't often work out too well. Because the, if you don't fill it with something positive, the evil spirit's coming back with seven buddies. And you can sit there and say all you want. I am not going to think about this. I am not going to think about this. I am not going to think about this. And it will consume you as you think about it. 
You might think, I'm not going to be envious. But man, I want that. (laughs) And it's not fair. You might think, I'm not going to worry. But man, I'm really concerned. See, you, you can't just fight to clean up. Look at Matthew 5. Jesus in Matthew 5 talks about a lot of different sins. And he gives real good insight into this. He says, let's zoom in a little bit on this. Zoom in on the word of the Lord. You have heard it said, don't murder. But I say, everyone who's angry with his brother is liable to judgment. It's not just don't murder. Look at the next one. You've heard it said, don't commit adultery. But I say, don't look at a woman with lustful intent. Or you've committed the adultery already in your heart. And the people thought, oh, you know, we're good. We're going to, um, we're, we're going to, to, to wash our hands before we eat. So we're not defiling. And Jesus says, no, what defiles a person is what comes out of their heart. Envy, jealousy, lust, anger, bitterness. These are the roots that grow into the massive trees. And so the concern here isn't simply, well, I need to, I don't want to get stoned. You know, I need to stop at one glass of wine. I don't want to get drunk. The concern goes a whole lot deeper. The concern goes to how are we going to deal with this idea that I, I, I can't, I react when I'm under stress with anger. People would characterize me as short-tempered. Or people would characterize me as haughty, prideful. Or, or really my drive in life is to get enough money to where I got money. Or my drive in life is to get power or prestige. Instead of understanding Jesus' desire was to wash their feet. The Son of Man didn't come to be served but to serve. And we lose track of godliness because we're letting our own desires try to fill in a void of crying out. Even after being saved of crying out for something in this life when what we need is godliness. And so if we go back to the computer, you've got passages that address this, like Philippians 4, 6 through 9. Paul is really profound in what he says there. Paul doesn't simply say, don't be worried. Paul says, be worried in nothing, but... In everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. See, he doesn't simply say the negative, clean it up. He says, put the positive in there. As we've grown 2,000 years in our understanding of this world, We know now that the human mind is composed of basically neural and glial cells. And these cells are what help us in conscious thought. And they do so by making connections. And those connections have chemical releases. And some of those chemicals can give you euphoric, wonderful feelings. Some of those chemicals can drive you in fear. Some of those chemicals can give you peace. And we have trained our bodies in the way it handles and responds to the outside stimuli of this world. And God says, I want it retrained. And it's not simply tell your brain to quit sending out fear chemicals. It's instead teach your brain to send out faith chemicals. So Paul doesn't simply say, don't worry. He says, but instead, in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, tell God what you're worried about and let His peace overwhelm you. 
you want the positives in place of the negatives. You don't want the worry to say, okay, well, now I'm not worried because God, Paul said don't worry and you didn't read the rest of the verse. And then five minutes later, worry brings back seven other friends, including desperateness. And you find yourself doing things you never dreamed you'd do. When if instead you're focused on God and trying to fill with God and godliness and godly behavior, you find yourself doing what God wants you to do, the chemicals will begin to reform in your brain. And you will grow in sanctification before the Lord and become more like the image of Jesus. Paul goes on to say in that Philippians 4 passage, he says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, of good repute, if there be any excellence in these things, let your hearts and minds dwell on these things and the God of peace will be with you. So when you're sitting there and you're thinking, you know, I'll, I'll, I had a, a young teenage boy come up to me one time in class and he said, Mr. Mark, and he's a good kid, he's a great kid, I, I really love this kid. It's been far enough now to where kids come up to me all the time. So if you've ever seen a kid up here, don't say, oh, I wonder if that was the one. That's like not good thoughts. Replace that with good thoughts, okay? So, so this kid comes up a long time ago. This kid's long gone. Comes up to me, he says, Mr. Mark, I'm having a problem with lust. I said, how old are you? He said, 15. I said, brother, it's a long road. (laughs) But I said, let me give you some ideas. First of all, when that lust comes into your mind, instead of gratifying that lust or dwelling on that lust, I said, I want you to commit this passage from Philippians to memory. And I want you to work through it. I want you to think, I'm going to think of something that's true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, of good repute. I said, you'll get halfway through that list trying to think of something new each time, and you'll get so distracted by life that the lust will be gone. You'll rarely make it through the whole list. But you need to train your body as a young man. Train those brain chemicals. Don't get on the internet and look at porn. All you're doing is training the brain chemicals the wrong way. You want to train those brain chemicals. Don't react in anger. When you find yourself reacting in anger, don't just say, I want to count to ten. Say, I'm going to pray for how to love in this situation. God, show me how to react in love. Show me how to display the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Teach me, Lord, not to sweep the house clean, but to sweep the house clean and invite in Jesus. You got it? So that's the joy of digging deeper. We're going to do that with a scripture each week. Uh, Pastor Stephen, if you'd send me another scripture this week, I'll work on it. And I'll try to get it down and apply it in my life as you challenged me to. Thank you for challenging us as a congregation. I also want to take this moment before I bless you in the name of Jesus to leave. And if you have not loved on Pastor Stephen, he has the very difficult job of not only seeing to the North Klein campus, which basically bears his fingerprints as as he has has, uh, been used by God to build that place up, but coming over here and blessing this campus as well and keeping more balls in the air than any human could do alone. He leans heavily on the Lord. We bear the fruit of that, but if you're not hugging on his neck and his sweet wife's neck, then you are not doing them justice. So love and encourage and pray for them with all they're doing to our blessing, okay? And now... To him who is able to do far more exceedingly abundant than anything you can ask of, think of, or dream of. If you will entrust yourself to him, he will sanctify and make you holy. And to him be all the glory and praise forever and ever. Amen in Jesus. I'll see you next week, God willing.